We'll get started. Thank you all for coming to our Friday afternoon lecture, a part of our series in which we bring world famous and illustrious people to speak. We're especially gratified if those illustrious people happen to be on hand, as is the case today with our speaker, John Hopkins. Now, I was thinking of how best to introduce this talk. I could say, for example, that it is the uh, it is a special occasion, it being uh, the last lecture he will give, but I know that not to be the case. I suspect there will be many more, and so I refuse to get all sentimental about the occasion, because I know we can entice the man back to speak again and again and again as we want to. And the second reason is that, of course, I just found out from the president of the university that it is now the chair's decision whether or not to rescind or accept the retirement. <laughs> keep John on for at least another decade. <laughs> He's not saying anything. Well, in any case, it is a delight, a pleasure, and a very great honor to be able to introduce John today, who will be speaking to us on a subject dear to his heart and all of ours, which is the publication-oriented field school integrating research and teaching with undergraduates. Now at 6.30, there will be a dinner at the Bombay House, because the dinner tonight is both in honor of John and also to uh, mark the occasion of, of David Crandall's talk a couple of weeks ago. Uh, so any of you who would like to accompany us to the Bombay House are free to do so. We always like to take at least one student uh, along with us. If any of you who are in that category wish to compete for the position, let me know as soon as the talk is over, and we'll see if we can possibly work that out. It's kind of a first come, first serve <laughs> selection process, so march down here quickly and let me know. Charles, yes? Now we need to know how many yeah. are coming. We do need to know. We ha will have to know uh, right after the talk is over, so no really a dallying on that point. So without any further ado, let me, let me uh, turn the floor over to our Distinguished colleague John Hawkins, you're all anxious to hear him speak. Well, first, I am honored to be here and to talk with you. And, uh, and I've got more family here than I expected, because I thought there were some conflicts that would make that impossible. Um, Jake Hickman also would have been here, but he is attending family, and um, uh, his wife just delivered a child last this morning. This morning, not last anything. Um, and so he arranged to have this videotaped so that he could be a part of it too. Um, the topic here is something that I've been trying to work on uh, over many years. And let me just do a sound check with you. Are, have you got what you need for sound? Okay. Um, they've, they've got me wired up here somehow. Um, so I've been working for quite a number of years. A first field school that I took went to San Marcos in 1978. And then I also had a field school in uh, San Cristobal to Chiapas in about 1982, maybe. Yeah, I think it was 82. Date doesn't really matter. But I really got going on it after the warfare in Guatemala calmed down. And uh, I had been doing field work in Guatemala for a long period of time. They went into a civil war. We had no field work. Almost no anthropologists did anything during the late 70s to the uh, late 80s. And uh, I started taking a group back in 1995, which was a year before the peace accords were signed that formally ended the war. So we actually had field school two summers during a period of formal warfare. Um, but it was quite calm. I shouldn't say that now because my wife will be just <laughs> worried about why I didn't tell her that beforehand. <clears throat> um, OK, objectives today. I want to show that an undergraduate field school and, and and this is novel in the discipline of anthropology, but I want to show that an undergraduate field school can produce legitimate refereed research, marked in green, 
that it generates real learning. I'm going to show that the field school modality is the most real learning you will get at this university and maybe any time in your life. Well, no, because your life is doing and living, so that generates real learning too. And that the field school then integrates research and teaching. And uh, for me, it has been the most satisfying thing that I have done as a professor, and I'm maybe getting a little emotional about it here, and that's okay. Let me bring us back to this reality. What is a field school? I take the words here from Tim Wallace, who heads the North Carolina State University uh, field school in Guatemala, and also formerly in Costa Rica. It is an intensive extended stay in a locale that is significantly different from the students' usual surroundings. Now, it doesn't have to be a foreign land, but it has to be out of your ordinary uh, existence as students. During which time the program's director combines instruction in ethnographic methods with the conduct of actual research. Now the actual research is important. It cannot be stuff that doesn't matter in order for you as students to learn. If you're going to learn, it has to matter. And because it matters, you will learn. And, that, uh, and we'll come back to that. You'll see how that ties in. A field school is not an off-campus study abroad program that gives wonderful courses. And I'm not saying that that's bad. That is good, but that's not a field school. It's not a travel study program. Uh, as I say, both are good, both, neither is a field school. A field school is instruction in research and then mentoring of the student in the process of research until the student is sufficiently independent to qualify as a young um, participant in the discipline, a young colleague. So it teaches how to research, we monitor and critique, and you must be engaged in the research. It improves your mastery of the craft and of the thought behind the craft. It increases your participation in the discipline and it engages you in a community of practice. You become colleagues with the professors that you do this with. So what I want to emphasize here that is that research in fact is a community of practice. The lone researcher does not really exist. You engage the world to discover data. Now, the community part is that you must share the data and its relevance to theory with some community of individuals that are interested either in the data or in the theory and in understanding how the world works. And we do it not just purely to engage in research, but, and it, or it, let me rephrase that, it has to be a community so that the implications can be extended. Now, the research can be used in public policy. It can drive our community practice of life. Um, it can be extended in life practice as an individual. You, the individual, can um, take the research knowledge and make your life better. And it sh could and should be done in such a way that it furthers or extends research so that others can use your material. And to do that, you need to have either taught the material to those who can extend it or put it into their life practice, give it out in conference interaction, which is an, an early but and non-final stage in which you express your ideas and find out how the work, how the logic of it works. And Christy Roser's been here, you've done this two or three times. Did it change the way that you saw your research just to present it to outside PhDs and others? Definitely, definitely. You felt connected to the, the greater anthropological community. You got to share ideas, meet other people. That was a great experience. All of that, but it, did it change the logic of how you were thinking about what you were doing and what you were saying and the data you had? Yeah. I mean, especially when we had someone from Nawala attend that lecture in San Francisco. Uh huh. Different spin on things. Hard to see. Very good. And then finally, you want to get the material into refereed or other publication venues so that 
others can take the data and think about how you're thinking about theory and make an assessment of whether that is an appropriate um, uh, rendition of reality or way to think about it or not. Now let's see, I've got to think of what button it is I've got to push on this thing. Now, the question I want to address for a few minutes is why engage students in doing research? And in particular, why engage undergraduate students in doing research? And my answer to that is in order to learn. The only real source of a grasp of the concepts is to engage in doing uh, the practice of the discipline. Uh, how many of us would think a violinist was a skilled, or a music major was a skilled music major, if, or a good music major, if they had no ability to play an instrument? We, we would think it laughable. Or a drama program that didn't have uh, plays for, for students to, uh, to engage in. You have to engage to understand the concepts. And it is also, we need to do it so that the students are involved in the full round of the practice, the full round of what the community does, so that the student is, at a beginning level, fully engaged. Now, this has a long history behind it. John Dewey, among others, and I'll just give a couple of quotes here. Sorry, I got to read them, but he polished his language pretty well. Students must engage in practice work as an instrument in making real and vital one's theoretical instruction. So it can't be real and vital unless you practice what the theory is. And this doesn't mean that, that the classroom is worthless. It means that the classroom is worthless unless afterwards you go out and engage and do. Every educative process should begin with doing something, and the, and the italics are his, inherently significant and of such a nature that the pupil anticipates its importance enough to take a vital interest in it. Okay? That's what a field school and what a practice and doing should, should accomplish. Okay, Vygotsky, a Russian psychologist and, and, and uh, person engaged in learning theory. Okay, direct instruction in concepts is impossible. It is pedagogically fruitless. It achieves nothing but a mindless learning of words. How many of you have memorized those words for one exam or another, and the bell rings on the last class and you head home for Christmas, and how much of it stays in the brain box? Often not a lot. In school, verbal modes of learning substitute the learning of dead and empty verbal schemes for the mastery of living knowledge. Okay? Now, when you engage in a field school in archaeology, or when you engage in a field school in ethnography, or when you engage in a field school and a field research expedition in biology, or go in the lab in chemistry, you cement these uh, concepts in your mind. And there's good research on that, which I'm going to <coughs> skip over. Let's see, where does this have to aim at? Dewey. The subject matter is learned in isolation in a classroom, in a watertight compartment. Look at this room. It is a, it's not quite watertight, but it is in isolation. It was segregated when it was acquired and hence is so disconnected from the rest of experience that it is not available under the actual conditions of life. Now there's a little irony here. I'm giving you a lecture about being connected in a disconnected place. You need to go out. You need to search out and find your way to a mentored field school first and then the practice of uh, the full discipline relatively independently thereafter. Okay, learning of this kind, that is the, the classroom context kind, no matter how thoroughly ingrained at the time, cannot give genuine preparation. Now, I'll just leave that with you. But John Dewey, Vygotsky, um, Lave and Wegner, in, in, uh, anthropologist and uh, educational psychologist in uh, very recent works, all have arrived at the same thing. Apprenticeship is the best mode of learning. Uh, won't say more. Can't say more and get to the rest. We could stop on that forever. 
I give up on this thing. Let's just go to the tried and true method. I found one by Nietzsche that I thought was entertaining too. No one can extract from things, books included, or lectures included, more than he or she already knows. What one has no access to through experience, one has no ear for. Now, one of the reasons that things get vibrant around here in September is because students come back from a summer of fieldwork and you can hear the buzz in the hallways. It is just absolutely, what's the right word, energizing um, because, and, and it makes the classes energetic because the students have access through experience to what they are then learning. Oh, that helps me to understand what happened three months ago when I was among the da-da-da. It, it really makes teaching exciting. Hopefully it also makes learning exciting. So my summary here, doing the application is essential to learning. Learning without doing is wasted effort. Now, that said, this is all then preface for a field school. The implications for your curriculum and for life, a field school is essential. Now, you can't just go out and do it on your own. You have to have, you, you can't go out and paint like Raphael. You have to go and be an apprentice in Raphael's uh, workshop in um, Italy in the 1500s and so on. So the first stage is field school with a mentor is essential. The faculty engage, and, and for a faculty and for all of us in this department or in any department, we should be having practical project level stuff from 101 on. For students, even if your classroom doesn't give you the practical thing from uh, right in the classroom, you should be applying what you are learning to some kind of research investigation, some kind of real topic that long-term interests you in order for you to learn the material of that classroom. In addition, you should use your anthro class concepts to analyze your daily life. Watch your family, watch your roommates, see what's going on, enjoy the dating scene as a third analytic party uh, to it. Um, whether you're on that date or not doesn't matter. Life is entertaining and watching it as an anthropologist is a lot of fun. But, <laughs> um, but it will make your class concepts come alive and lock into your mind. It's essential. Mm, I forgot this is not working. Let me just get rid of it. Okay, there's a set of ethical reasons also. It makes you learn, but there's ethics to it. Well, I said the, the, the learning part. You, you engage in, you experience the full round of practice so that you find out, is anthropology or archeology span right for me? And maybe not. There's no harm in going to any other discipline. Find out early if this subject stinks to you, get rid of it and get going, and you'll save yourself a lot of time and money and do that in any discipline. Um, but the real ethics of it is that anthropology has some good concepts, can help you analyze life, and you should take it through to any other discipline. You don't have to stay the anthropologist uh, to be faithful to the field. And it's good for the people who are studied. I'll just pass that over kind of lightly. Um, there are some practicalities to carrying through to publication. Doing a field school takes an enormous amount of faculty time. The setup time is unbelievable. Um, and then the in-field time is considerable. Now what I'm arguing is that a, what it would, in poker I think would be known, I don't know these terms for sure, but it's doubling down on a bet. Okay, you increase the amount of time invested in order to carry the initial investment through to something valuable. The Mayas know about this and, uh, and um, uh, in their concept of uh, milpa culture and investing more and more into their small plot of land, but it keeps them uh, survivable. 
and it, and it recovers the time of the initial field school, but I argue the field school is necessary to education. So if you're gonna get educated, we've got to have field schools. If we're gonna stay on the faculty, we've got to publish. The only solution is to make the field school uh, bridge to and result in publications. But that's a cooperative effort. You people, as young students, have got to be in, even lead out and interact with us and make it happen so that when you go to a field school, offer, I'm going to do, first of all, invest yourself. Make that field school effort so much hard work that you have a really good product and then share with your professor and begin the process of collaborative writing on it. I'll come more to that in a minute, but I want you to see kind of how it works. And it's not just the faculty pushing it on you. You need to push the faculty because they will get distracted. They're easily distractible. <laughs> and make it go for refereed publications. It's a little harder than it looks uh, and it's easy to say, but the work can be done to make it happen. Now, how did we do it? We did it uh, as a field school in, here's a picture of Nawala in Guatemala, the BYU Nawala Santa Catarina Field School. We had uh, summers from 1995 to 2006 continuous. We had an additional summer with a little bit less than adequate supervision in 2010. And, um, we had a couple of uh, fall and winter semesters spaced out in 1995 to 2006. We had a very nice NSF grant from 2002 to 2006. I thank them again. Um, products to date. Uh, I've got a couple of faculty author authored methods uh, articles. It has just, the, the result of this has only a couple of months ago, been accepted in current anthropology entitled Field School as a Research Method. And it was a little bit uh, large, and so we negotiated and I cut a section out, and it is now in, the cut section is in an electronic supplement, also with current anthropology. So I have a 32,000 word piece that is in current anthropology, where <clears throat> nine to 10,000 is the, preferred and 12 is the max. And, and they're, they're, they seem to be happy about it, so am I. It's off my back. In addition, we have these three books. Sometimes it's easier to see them in physical form like that. Yay, there are 25 of you um, published in this so far and I'm working on another one. But there are those. And that's still in the pipeline, but I'm getting behind, so we're gonna just move right along. Now, what is the goal? I argue that the goal in a field school should be to involve you as apprentices in legitimate work. You begin in what Lave and Wegner call legitimate, which means it's real stuff you're working on. Peripheral means you're at the side in the beginning. You don't you know, write the article in the beginning. In an apprenticeship, you, you know, think about your old movies about England and so on. The apprentice took errands and went and gave messages and brought coal from the basement and did all kinds of stuff. But you get the, 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 the scope of the work by starting small and increasing within it. Now, in a field school and with college students, we should have you conceptualizing your research or beginning to, but always interacting with masters of the craft. If you were working in Michelangelo's um, uh, shop, or what's the right word, studio, I guess it would be, and you were starting a project, would you not consult with Michelangelo? You know, how, what do you think of this idea and so on? You want to do all of that, but take the conceptualization in hand. Work on the literature review. Uh, work with the faculty on additional items of literature and so on. Then you go into the field for data acquisition. Then you come back and be involved in the analysis. And we've formalized that with classes that are even better than what uh, I did in the, in the field school back then. Then you're involved in write-up and we've formalized that within the department into the curriculum. It's become core to the curriculum. 
and you give then give presentations at uh, local conferences and then regional conference and then a national conference you are getting yourself into the the discipline that way you make revisions don't kid yourself this is not something you do you know saturday night uh, or or monday morning before it's due on monday afternoon it's lots of revisions. It is going over it and over it and over it. And Sandy is nodding her head. And you've seen John Clark in there slaving at it and, um, and so on. Lots of revision. Don't back off from it. Just get, we all do it, do it. And then you work it toward publication. And why the complete process? because the process, pushing it through to publication, makes the outcome of the endeavor sustainable. It is career enhancing for the faculty person if you as a student work with the faculty person for a co-publication. It's career enhancing for you as a student, even more career enhancing for you as a student, to work with a faculty person for a first co-publication. And that solves your problem in getting into the discipline, and it solves the faculty problem of keeping a uh, career process and, and tenure judgment and all that sort of thing going. And in addition to all of that self-serving necessity, it is the best form of education and the best form of general education. If you know you're going to publish, and you're taking a stats class, and you know that what you say about statistics is going to be seen by the rest of the world, guess what? You'll pay attention. And your English class, and your anthropology classes, and so on. It's great stuff. Great incentive. Um, so far, we've had about 220 students in many of disciplines. Only about a third of them are anthropology, but I don't have an exactly accurate uh, thing on that. In Guatemala, we started at eight weeks, but we quickly found that was a considerably too short. We moved it to 13 weeks in which there are six weeks of work, a vacation, a week plus a weekend of vacation, and then six more weeks. And um, we meet, um, uh, you do anthropology six days a week. There's something wrong there, and I don't know quite what it is. But um, you have independent research and residence with the families. Oh, the one day a week is in classroom. There it is. I just skipped down a line. Um, so you're in class one day a week. You go to church on Sunday. You go to church sometimes in the Mormon church, sometimes in the Catholic church, sometimes in the Pentecostal church. Sometimes you go up in the hills with the shaman and, um, uh, and, 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 and see a ceremony performed there. Every second week, we had a three-day travel weekend. Before we formalized that, people were sneaking off all different times, and it wasn't very good. Um, how to do it? Well, you've got to have three phases, and you've got to have each of those three phases wrap. Well, no, that's my view of it. I think there, that it comes in three phases, and you want to have each of the phases support the other after you've been through it one cycle. The pre-field is preparation. You've got to recruit students. Now, we have some of that recruitment uh, solved since this concept in our um, requirement to go to a field school. But that requirement is good and is in your best interest. I hope you will see by the end of this or at the beginning of it. Um, but get prepared. You've got to take the courses. If you're going to study something about religion, take the anthropology of religion and maybe a sociology of religion. If you're going to do something on economic life in a community, take the economics and political class before you get there. Take the area studies class. And if we don't have, we're a small department, if we don't have the area covered, go over and take a history and culture class or somewhere else or read 10 books and, um, uh, and, and deal. Um, research in field, you're doing the research. After the field, you're writing up and professionalizing, and it is a cycle. I've mentioned that. You've probably read ahead. I'm going to skip along. Pre-field. Have high expectations. Now, most of you in here are anthropology students, so I don't think I have to worry about that. You have high expectations of yourselves. We have high expectations of you. Make it happen. Make those um, all the way through. 
Um, expect some nasty conditions and expect that your body and your mind will react with some culture shock and some revulsion to nasty conditions and so on. But knowing that it's going to happen, you'll get over it, you'll get used to it, and, um, and, and you'll be proud of it afterwards. And there are great rewards. I suggest, at least for me personally, the best student-faculty relations that I have had have consistently come out, with maybe two exceptions, uh, I, I have been with those 200 students that have gone to Guatemala. It's personal growth for you, it has been for me too. And it is an enormous step up in graduate school admission. Now, I've got a couple of quotes at the end of our students that have been on how it impacted their graduate student admission, so hang on to that one, but just let me say, you will be light years ahead of your peers if you have done your field school and taken it seriously and written it up and send them a copy along with your application. Uh, it impresses. Um, for the Guatemala Field School, we required four courses. One was in the Kennedy Center and the other three are in anthropology. An area studies class, I taught a Guatemala class. A topic class, some one of our faculty taught religion or economics or kinship or whatever it was. And uh, including a food class and so on. It doesn't have to be quite those traditional ones. And the field methods class, 442. You got to do that before you go. Even though I have already said that you don't learn it in that class, you have to be exposed to it so that when you're in the field, you can reread it so that you figure out what it's about so that you can really learn it. We had a Quiche class, which was optional, but almost everybody took it. And uh, it was a requirement that you speak conversationally reasonable Spanish. We didn't care about grammaticality, but if you could mouth the words and, and, uh, uh, and get going in it without uh, hiccuping too much, you were eligible. Um, you have to get, nowadays, we didn't back then so much, but nowadays you have to get IRB authorization. And I'm going to kind of skip through this, but the key thing, well, no, several of you have got to do IRBs. Emergent methods, get that into your IRB application, is it gives you permission to change as you're going along, which is a research style that they know nothing about. Um, <laughs> In field, the, what I consider to be the elements of success, class one day a week. Now there are all kinds of field schools and, they have, and many things have been tried. Some will have class every morning and in the afternoon you go out and do research. I think that that's too intrusive. It, 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 um, uh, you miss the wake up, you miss what people are doing in the mornings, for example. So we elected to miss every Monday. Now, I, I suppose if I were accurate, this would be an ethnography of uh, Tuesday through Sunday. Because we didn't see much of Monday, because we did stay in class. But nothing different really happened on Monday that didn't happen on Tuesday. So hold your class on a day that is, like, that is not a special day. Um, in the class, we review we review field methods. We talk about them just the way we did in 442 class, except that we had the students present, and they were all struggling with a project, so we talked about how that method applies to what you now, with gritted teeth, are trying to do, and that makes a difference. Um, and the area studies, we would talk about Guatemala, for example, in the ethnography, we read a couple of books, and the assignment was fairly simple write a half a page summary of the chapter you read and relate three instances from what you saw last week in your family that connect to something in that chapter. In other words, take the theory of the book and relate it to the life that you are currently living as an anthropologist in the field. Um, and, um, and the same with religion. We, would, we had a religion, a text of the anthropology of religion. Even though everybody had studied the anthropology of religion, we quickly went over those concepts because now you're not only st studying it out of a book, you're trying to make people's religious statements make sense. And that's a little daunting and so on, whether it's religion or whatever it is. Okay, we had the students present all the material so that instead of being a lecturer and speeding on like I am right now, I would just 
sit to the side and maybe fall asleep and if I woke up, uh, make a comment to it that um, uh, if there was something that I thought got left out. Um, I must have been talking, Draculus is asleep. The focus, though, in the class is always on your individual project and how to make your project work and what is the emergent result, what is the data coming out of your project. And that made a difference. So here's one of the families that I lived with for several summers. And as an additional element of success, I suggest that students should be housed with families. They will get sick more often. Big deal. They now know something of what uh, other people experience in life. And, um, um, and house them individually with the families because if you put two or more American kids in a family together, guess who they will talk with? Each other. They learn nothing except uh, from each other. So spread them out with, with families as best you can. Now, some prudence may have to be um, used on that, but far and away in Guatemala, that was the best thing we ever did. And that's what the research literature of other field schools, every field school that has talked about either using a hotel or housing students in groups of two or more has said only once, never again. Um, and then the, the, the six days of independent research, so you're in class, then be independent for six days and plan your week. Nowadays you have cell phone contact and, uh, and you can get your professor to come out and be with you to solve a problem in an hour or two and, um, and, and that's just the way to do it. Or you can talk to them by cell phone at night and, and discuss the project as you're going along. Other elements of success, note keeping. You just have to write your diary and your notes every night. So uh, Matthew and Samuel, when you guys now have your diaries, you write a little bit every night and then you will be just like these guys and be ready for it, okay? Um, it's the same principle. And your memory will change everything if you sleep on it. Your dream work will put it into the categories that your dream work wants and you're stuck. Um, uh, at the two-thirds point, we would have a conference in which students would give an outline of what they understood, what their data was, and what they thought its significance was. They would present it orally, and then uh, they would spend the last three weeks focusing on the gaps that you figure out when you get questions and answers and, and try and organize that thing. So it's a great way to focus your last three weeks. When you come back, you need to write and you need to get all this organized. And it's not easy. It is <laughs> it's terribly difficult because you have tons of written material, you have boxes of papers and slides and tape recordings and it's messy and nobody followed your plan on your outline agenda. They, they came and said, no, we're not doing that today. There's a ceremony over here or whatever it is. And you got to get all that organized. And you have classes and you have work and you have social life and, uh, and um, um, no more needs to be said. So the support systems. Now, when we were doing it at the age of you guys back a few years, um, we would have an English class and maybe an evening seminar get together and so on. But we've formalized it. We've gotten more classes until we finally formalized it where it's a requirement for everybody. And that's great. First draft by December, and then professional presentations, and we've had uh, many of them, uh, and I'll just go skipping by that. But that's really important, because the, working it through and talking it before increasingly professional sets of peers makes your work enter into the profession at a competent level and then you're not laughed at and, um, and, and, uh, and, and rejected at the next thing or you're, the peers coming after you don't get rejected by the, the memory of people have of the presentations. It has to be professional. You've got to do a good job. And that's why you have to be engaged. Um, multiple edits by the faculty, redrafts and so on, and you'll be sick of it in, in a way. 
but you've got to do it and you've got to aim it for publication. Ideally, either as standalone journal articles with your faculty as co-authors, and I'll re-emphasize co-authorship, um, or uh, we have done it in this format as a book with six to ten or so um, uh, uh, interrelated chapters on a theme. It could be done in film. We've had a couple of films come out of Guatemala, um, and there are other options also. But ideally, the refereed venue in co-authorship with your faculty so that everybody benefits from that and it becomes self-sustaining because you want your faculty to stay on the job too. There are difficulties. There's no rest for the faculty. Carolee will attest to this. Um, um, it's just hard. Now, we, in our department, we have done some negotiation now for trading uh, spring and summer for a fall or winter class. Um, there is some level of family distress being gone for three months a year. Some families have handled it, uh, Dave Crandall's by the, the whole family goes. Um, and that's a great way to do it too. Another is faculty rotation and so on. There are variations. I talk about uh, several of these variations in that journal article and I'll find out from the journal if I'm allowed to post it for you guys to have immediate access to it or not. But I don't know the answer to that right now. Um, but when you are co-authoring with students, your other publications will go down. There is, uh, there is that time trade-off. And that's why the co-authorship with undergraduates is, a, a, is essential. Advantages to the faculty, when here's some of our teaching settings in Guatemala. It absolutely ends the teaching versus research dilemma. And you've probably read about this in the Newsweek or the uh, Journal of, um, or the uh, Chronicle of Higher Education and so on, about the disappearing faculty. Why is it that the students who are trying to get an education supposedly provided by the faculty can't get in touch with the faculty? How many of you read something like that of you students? Nobody? Heard about it? Yeah. And, and um, at a research-oriented university, the reason that happens is that the faculty are being retained and promoted and their salaries are based on the research that they do, not on the teaching that they do, which gets a very gives you a very schizophrenic life. So the faculty hide and the students wonder where this education is. If you co-author with the faculty, even as an undergraduate, you automatically solve that problem from your student point of view and you solve the problem from the faculty point of view by getting teaching and research into apprenticeship as a single coordinated activity. We all ought to go back to the Middle Ages on that one. Um, so from my point of view, extraordinary relations with students. From your point of view, you collectively as the students, extraordinary relations with the faculty. And uh, enough. Advantages to the discipline, you get the research by fieldwork and publication. These communities in Guatemala had nothing written about them. They were, there'd been a couple of doctoral dissertations that had disappeared into oblivion, but nothing in print. And so this meets the advantages, it contributes to the discipline with real contribution. And it teaches you the full core of the um, community of practice and it is the very best pedagogy. It's win-win for everybody, but it does take some time. Um, in addition to that, you guys become recruits either to this discipline or if not, you will carry the best abilities of anthropology into some other discipline, medicine, law. Do you have, in law, do you need to be able to interview people as to what went on in the crime or the legal case or whatever? Do you have to understand the culture in order to be able to present a case? Do you have to understand the jury and so on? Yes, you can carry all of this into any discipline, um, even accounting. I won't take time to explain that one, come afterwards. Um, and it, truly mercifully weeds out those who do not like anthropology or archaeology. Find out as an undergraduate that the real practice of it isn't for me. That's a blessing. 
I know too many people that have gone on and spent $100,000 or more in graduate school and said, this isn't for me. And that's a tragedy. Um, not just economic, but time and life and anger and so on. So if it suits you, you'll find out in between your junior and senior year. And if it doesn't suit you, bail out. And that's great. Or change you know, for a graduate degree in something else. Um, and it seeds the other disciplines. We've talked about that, so let's keep rolling here. How am I doing? Ooh, I gotta hurry. Um, I'm gonna hurry. Too many advantages to the discipline, but that's okay. Is this not changing? Yes, it is. Um, I would say, again, the advantage in the discipline is it converts the necessary, what some people might call the necessary burden of teaching in the field and teaching the methods and an extraordinary sacrifice of the summer field school. I've had faculty say to me, how can you possibly do that? It takes too much time. The reason I can do it is because we have added time and then converted it into the research productivity. And that makes it the productive research engine. Few have published from an undergraduate field school. It is a new model, and it is a vast resource to the discipline, but I just won't say more about that. Um, these are some things that have actually been said in professional journals about the first two volumes. Let me just let you take a moment to scan a couple of those. But I won't take longer. Be a speed reader. Advantages for the students, it's just more than I can even talk about. Personal growth, yes. Education, general education, absolutely. Cultural awareness, yes. And I've got some better quotes rather than these bullets. Community service, uh, profession, getting into the profession, just a few of them. Graduate or professional school, everybody that's had a field school experience and a manuscript and so on uh, is way ahead of their peers. And I've got some quotes that we'll just skip over that a little bit. All your general education, your skills courses, motivation, everything. Uh, here are some student quotes and I've got a couple more after this. Amazing opportunities for learning and growth led me to realize that traditional Western methods of assessment and treatment are not appropriate for many culturally diverse groups. That actually is coming from a person who's running a hospital system. Um, significantly changed my perspective on the world. I am grateful for all that the Nawalensis uh, taught me. And then uh, you guys as students taught me how to set up a uh, Facebook page on the, our field school about four days ago. And here's some of the results in the last uh, few hours. Nikki Matheny, now I am uh, abbreviating their married name to, so that it's the names by which we old faculty that can't learn new names uh, knew these people. Here's Nikki Matheny, quote, the Guatemalan field school has impacted my life for multiple reasons. And it's still quoting, although the quotes aren't there. It gave me real world experience conducting anthropological fieldwork and research. It helped me understand what it was really like to work as an anthropologist. It helped me to decide, and I amended it, to pursue a graduate degree in anthropology. The rest is quotes. This decision continues to impact me today as I work as an applied anthropologist. And in some of her other comments, in my graduate program, very few of my classmates had any substantial fieldwork experience as undergraduates. Let me pause as an aside. I, in the article, I calculate and figure out that between 2 and 4% of ethnographic undergraduates have fieldwork experience of uh, more than five weeks. And uh, two to four percent. So automatically going to your department's field school puts you in the top two percent, uh, at least on that attribute of candidates. It, it makes you a very different uh, person. Let alone the rich, well-organized and mentored experience that I had. The experience I had conducting fieldwork under Hawkins and Adams and the opportunity to write a research paper based on that fieldwork helped me be better prepared for research and writing at the graduate level and beyond. Uh, Christy Roser, wave your hand. Nuthall. 
My most powerful learning, and is this a direct quote? Absolutely. My most powerful learning experiences through BYU were not in Provo, but in Guatemala. Uh, oops, that should be a comma. As a student and as a field facilitator. Actually, it should be three dots, not one. Um, there is just no comparison in the amazing growth and learning I experienced in the field study program, which is what we used to call the field school before it was formalized as a field school, uh, versus the study, a program, study abroad program that she did or that I did in Mexico. Uh, Rose or still. I had the awesome opportunity in Guatemala of studying the split of a community in the aftermath of Hurricane Mitch. I got to go out and be an ethnographer and do interviews and surveys as well as participate in the actual exodus of the community of Ixtahuacan from a valley to a high plateau. Now I wasn't able to be there, but I can write about it and write about it with authority in the voice of your article and those of your peers that were there in the different summers and falls and winters. And we do not have the study of a community that has uh, um, trasladado, what's the English word, relocated itself in that way. In the literature, anywhere. Okay. Um, I developed leadership skills. I'll skip down. Dr. Hawkins encouraged us to write and rewrite our ethnographic research and prepare it for publication. I am proud of my paper on women and development published through Oklahoma Press. To have researched, uh, published in a book as an undergraduate is extraordinary. You'll have another one published mm, about a year from now. Um, oh. This is about the extensions in her life. So Christy went to India. Yes, I love the picture here. Uh, Christy's now chuckling at it. Um, I spent three years in India. I would never have had the courage to live on the other side of the world had I not received the training and education through the Guatemala Field Study Program. And in addition, it has other family impact. Our, her boys speak Spanish and have learned Hindi and so on. Um, I won't read it. Onward. Adriana. I like this picture of Adriana. Uh, she, is it clear that she's sitting on a motorcycle here in Guatemala? Almost suicidal. Um, field study. Expanded my worldview. Developed personal character. Experienced some of the most challenging and growth inspiring moments I ever had. I also learned much more about anthropology, Guatemalan culture and context, and professional research conduct than I ever could have from coursework in a university setting. Instills in students ownership of their educational experience and um, expects a high level of independence and professional conduct. Therefore, students learn quickly and perform accordingly. And here she is with Maria, I think Maria is her first name, Katinak was Maria, I'm forgetting her first name. Yeah, Maria Katinak. And this is still Adriana. Nine months. Now, she went out at her first opportunity uh, as a student in the field school. Then she came back and went another three months as a facilitator. Then she came back and did facilitation again. She went to graduate school with nine months of field work as an undergraduate, and that's more than many doctoral students get. Mm, presentations at national conferences, publications under review set me apart from other applicants and peers in graduate school and continue to serve as valuable tools in her career. And now she's currently living in Guatemala. I am currently, point number two, working as a consultant designing health and economic development programs all over Guatemala. My experience with the field study has been a major guiding influence on academic interests and my personal and professional development. Kevra Ellsworth, my summer in Guatemala was one of my fondest memories without, and she became a, Kevra, yeah, she became a midwife and she did her study on midwifery in Guatemala. Without your consistent work, contacts and diligence, so many students like myself would have never had this life-changing opportunity. And um, on we go. Jason Brown is, got a, is getting, got, I can't remember, got his PhD? Anyway, um, this is his quote. I should have put quotes around all of these. Real quick on how the field school has affected my life. I had a really sacred moment collecting herbs with my host family 
This is in Guatemala in the Misty Mountains where I realized I wanted to do forestry. I then went on to Yale Forestry School and Yale Divinity School. So he got MAs in forestry and divinity. He's now getting his PhD, I don't remember where. Guatemala was the foundation of my interest in religion and ecology, sacred forests and perceptions of ecology. Thank you. A final thought, if we want as faculty, and if you as students want to succeed in graduate school or carry anthropology's perspective into other disciplines, students, you must learn the perspective as undergraduates. You can't wait to graduate school to go to field school and do field work. You have to do it, you ought to do it as an undergraduate. So you, they, students, must learn the perspective as undergraduates. To learn the perspective, you students must have experience of it. Experience of it, you have to do it. And here's a quote from Hastrup in Anthropology, the mode of knowing is deeply embedded with the tradition of fieldwork. It's not embedded in the tradition of lectures, it's not embedded in the tradition of reading books, it's embedded in the experience of fieldwork and you are one of only two schools that I know of no, you are the only school that I know of, or you are in the department of the only school that I know of that requires a field school of undergraduates. I don't know of any others. Am I wrong on that? Union College uh, back east has several field schools that, and they, you know, it's, and students, most of them probably do it. But this is the only one that says you can't be educated without doing field work in either archeology span or ethnography. And the archaeologists, though, they're smarter than we are. They knew this 40 years ago when Ray Matheny started the field school. You can't be an archaeologist and you can't even succeed in graduate school without experiencing the doing. Same in ethnography. That's what I've been about and that's the proudest thing in my career. So, with that said, questions and um, those of you who need to go. <clears throat> We still have the room for half an hour. We probably don't want to have questions for all of that, but I'm game, so whatever you want to do. Your questions. I will do the lights. John. What do I get out of students as a professor that you wouldn't normally get? Okay, uh, let's say that I am prejudiced on that. So I've got two students here that have been to the field school. What did, it, what did you give that you wouldn't have given ordinarily? You were with me. No, you were on a different one. No, yeah. She went to Costa Rica. Yeah, okay, Christy. So, wait, so the question is what, what did we... What do... Is it, is it the labor extraction? What do I extract or what... Okay, turn around and... What benefits did the student bring to your research that you would normally not have had? Oh, what benefits did the students bring to my research that I normally would not have had? Well, for example, I took a dental student down there. I would never in my life have studied the dentistry of the Guatemalan Mayas, but this guy dove in and, and, and went to all the dental tooth extraction places and numbered them and counted rat feces on the floor and everything else and figured the costs relative to the wages and showed that, number one, dentistry and teeth, tooth mouth care health is a very accurate barometer of economic well-being in the community and in the world. I never would have thought to do that. You know, I'm going to learn. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> okay, so, but I've had two students do midwifery. I can't get into the midwifery session. Carolee. Chicago, when you first started in your career, I mean, it was only published, published for yourself. And it was a long evolution because of the field school where you realized the value of what the students brought to you and what you brought to the students and a totally different construct 
than what Chicago had taught you. And it took a lot of years to value it as the high point of his career. Yeah. Was it co published by students? Is it but, but it is, yeah. Right. Yeah, but the field the school and the publication. That, nor did they embed that in. Right, yeah. Right, right. True. True. But, but I could name other things like the dentistry. I just never would have dentistry. I wouldn't have done midwifery. I wouldn't, um, I wouldn't have gotten inside the elementary schools. I've had elementary ed and also anthro of education. I wouldn't have gone to the elementary schools. I wouldn't have uh, figured out all the forestry thing. You wouldn't have studied garbage either. Yeah, I wouldn't have gar there were a couple that did garbage, all kinds of stuff. Strange, and you know, it, and it seems strange. It, it wasn't my kinship and religion, my central core stuff. But it turns out that if you go far enough into garbage, it comes back to kinship and religion anyway. <laughs> my archaeology. This is certainly a, a different uh, approach to uh, anthropological fieldwork from the traditional one. How is this uh, uh, regarded by the professional community? general, those that even know anything about it. Do they see it as valuable or is there a lot of criticism of this, of, of the kind of thing you've been doing? I mean, you put up some positive reviews, but we all know you can put up positive reviews and skip the other ones. Yes. Okay. Well, first of all, uh, this article has gone through about six years of evolution. It has been rejected by 10 or 12 journals. Um, the rejections have always been kind of odd because all of the reviewers have said this is important but you didn't think about X, Y, and Z. So then I would take the reviews and include X, Y, and Z. At which point the paper was too long for any journal. So then I crush it back down to where it's the right size and send it out again. And, and in every case the reviewers had been people who had been um, who had led a field school and gave good comments. So I incorporate the reviews, it expands the darn thing, and I crush it back again. Uh, I only got one really bad set of reviews from, believe it or not, Anthropology and Education Quarterly, which is the journal that should be looking at how we can be better anthropologists, or how we can do our education within anthropology. It's in their mission statement. And they rejected it because it was not about education in colleges or, or uh, primary or secondary schools. And, uh, and I, I was irritated by that. I sent a very hostile letter back to them on that one, <laughs> <laughs> including a piece of their um, web page, which had as their front piece that it, um, <laughs> strange stuff. But anyway. So you can it, write an article about the evolution of this article. <laughs> 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 um, what I do show in the article, so now to respond to you. One, I show that collaborating with undergraduate students is no different than the collaborations that those reviewers did with me and the rewriting that I did on this piece, okay? So that um, collaborating in an undergraduate field school as a faculty person is, is not different than the ordinary collaboration of reviewing and rewriting and getting other perspectives and adding and, and so on. The second thing is that there have been critiques in anthropology that it has been too solo, too uh, too much the lone anthropologist. And that has an impact because you get a two-year slice. Sometimes that's replicated because the person goes back again and again and again, like you and I and several of us have. Or the other is that people like John Watanabe go back and redo what Charles Wigley did in Santiago Chimaltenango 30 years or 60 years later. Um, but nevertheless, it has been largely solo. John Watanabe went back. Now, uh, there is a whole strand of research that there are some advantages to team research. And Beebe's 2002 on rapid anthropology, and I can't remember what the other titles are. But so basically, part of the way I framed the argument is to say that collaboration with undergraduates gives multiple perspectives. I get multiple genders, well, two genders. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah. But, but my point is, I can't get 
very easily into the female side of life. So there's that. But I also can't get, and, and as time goes on, increasingly can't get into the young side of life. But you guys, as relative youngsters relative to me, are able to go and get kids' and children's views of things and so on. Um, so there are multiple perspectives, and that is one of the things that anthropology says. You know, we should get multiple perspectives on American life from um, uh, ba -ba 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 Democracy in America. I can't make his name come to mind right now. De Tocqueville and Harvey Varenne's Americans Together and Shoes, what's Shoes study of um, H.S. Shoe? Uh, I can't remember, but, uh, and so on, okay? Multiple perspectives is what we need. So an, a field school allows that right off. And then John, to your comment, on the religion study, uh, there, there's lots in the literature that, okay, you go and you study the traditionalists, but then the Pentecostals will hate you. And you can't go to visit the Pentecostals because you're afraid that the traditionalists will think you are uh, betraying them. So I put Christy in a Pentecostal group, and I put another in a charismatic Catholic group, and another with a traditionalist. I can go to all of them, because I'm Uncle John the, 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 the professor, and, um, and, and so I got into everything. So the next volume is on religion, and it has studies of every religious strand of the uh, Nahualense and, and Santa Catarina communities from both rural and urban with, the, with people that lived with the, uh, the, the shamans, people that lived with the ordinary Orthodox Roman Catholics, people that lived with the charismatic renewal Holy Ghost Catholics, people that lived with the Pentecostal Protestant um, uh, revivalists, and there's nothing like that in the literature. Nothing like it. And then beyond that, the fact that they got into all of these and that I could go in after them and visit all these meetings and take recordings and do transcriptions, and they've got transcriptions which I have access to. Beyond all of that, they, these students and that experience has forced me to think about religion and religion in Guatemala. And so the introduction is a theoretical transformation of the view of religion in Guatemala, which is what I'm writing. And it's taken me, I apologize, Christy, 10 dang years, <laughs> but three bucks in the process too. It's just, the data comes more faster than I can deal with. It's incredible. So the students become an aspect of your own personhood and you can split yourself up as many times as you They become my little fingers into the community. And then... Uh, little absolutely, absolutely. It would, it would do the NSA proud. <laughs> yes, 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 exactly. That, I like that better than the NSA. How does... How do you see this using undergraduate students, say in comparison to the Harvard project in Chiapas where they were bringing graduate students in and doing this? Okay. Would that have produced more sophisticated or uh, outcomes, or how would you compare that? Um, probably, first of all, yes. The, an undergraduate's three-month study, even with good supervision, is not going to be as sophisticated as a doctoral student that goes to Chiapas and also gets some mentoring and then is involved for a year or more in the community. So part of the deal on that is that I have many more uh, topics that get covered than would ordinarily be the case. And but maybe not every topic as deep as if a PhD dentist went and you know went zinging in there. But it is the only piece on dentistry in, in among the Maya in Guatemala. It's the, it's the only thing You're there. A broader yes. Of what's going on yeah. During a yeah. Relatively short period of time. Yes. And then uh, now one of the critiques, one one of the reviewers said. It is absolutely unreasonable to expect undergraduates to get control of the ethnographic literature, control of the theory, and do the ethnography, and have a, a publishable piece in a major journal. And my response to that was, 
You are quite correct. That's why it has to be a collaborative co-authorship with the faculty that provides the, the broader perspective on ethnographic and theoretical literature in addition to the student's immediacy of those details on that narrowed topic. And that makes a perfect synthesis. And that's the theory anyway. But it also pushes you beyond your comfort zone because you were family, kinship, ethnicity. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Look at this one. Crisis of governance in Maya Guatemala. That wasn't my area. Not a bit. Um, yeah. And, and this one. Healthcare in Maya Guatemala. And, um, and so I wrote a conclusion to it. It's a good conclusion. And um, good medicine steps toward a Maya accessible healthcare system because I had perspective partly from 40 years in Guatemala, partly from 14 students, no, more than that, because this was several years, it wasn't a coordinated um, uh, topic summer. Um, but it's, it's, it's amazing, okay? Now, it is true that my journal publications have dr had dropped in this 15 year period to almost zero, okay? But it is also the case that in the literature, I can, and in the article I quote from it, uh, scholars in the physical sciences that regularly collaborate with undergraduates, not, well, here too also, say that it takes about four times longer to collaborate with an undergraduate than to do it yourself, but that it is more, it is more important. So this particular author made an argument that an undergraduate collaboration is worth more in faculty rank and status than a solo authored thing because of both what you did and the collaboration. That person was chased out of the university. <laughs> no, not quite, but it is not a widely accepted notion at this university. Um, but, um, uh, yeah, so we agree with that. So. Yeah, I, yeah. But, only yeah. two to four percent in your profession are experiencing field schools. You have a lot of PR work to do yes. within the field and in universities in general. But this is now going out in the premier journal. This one is going to create a stir. Right. <laughs> right. Yes. So the students. I don't know if everybody will do field work. <laughs> the students get the opportunity to actually learn <clears throat> or die, basically. You have to perform or you're out of there. And you are the expert. And so they get to learn from your expertise. But what they bring to it, I would think, would be innocence and ignorance. And there's some of that. And they blunder into the most gosh awful situations and get wonderful data. And so they raise issues that you thought were resolved, and you just have a very bad or the wrong idea about them. And having students here should blow your mind wide open and reconsider everything. And you, you're probably learning 10 times as much as they're learning while they're with you. Right? Absolutely. Absolutely. John, Cindy. Maybe you guys do this already. I don't know. But this would be a wonderful presentation. I mean, to have a required freshman training class. It's required the fall semester they come in where they get a, the overview of this to understand why we're doing what we're doing and they can participate more fully in it. So I, I, I don't think students really understand this until maybe even their junior or senior year. And um, this would be fantastic, I think, to <coughs> get them when they're early and yeah. give them the whole yeah. picture, you know? So. It's just our version of water torture through a exactly. burger. <laughs> <laughs> Well, that's the spiel, and, and it works in archaeology. It's the very same thing. It works in ethnography. It works in field biology, ecology, forestry. Any discipline where you got to go out and interact, you should be able to take undergraduates. You ought to take the undergraduates so that they get the experience of the discipline and the full round of what that community is about. And, and then it doesn't matter. If, um, if Jason Brown abandoned anthropology, I don't know if he was an anthropology major. Do you, know, do you remember? I don't remember. Yes. Okay. 
Um, okay, even if he, quote, abandons anthropology, he's not going to really abandon it because he's going to take it into forestry research and theology. And because he learned anthropology with the experience, he's not going to forget his anthropology, which is... I believe he's at the University of British Columbia. He is at the University of British Columbia. I think on the faculty or in a PhD no, program or both? No. Yeah. And so now, how many of you are in the, re in the remainder here have been out on your field school for the summer that are current students? You have, okay. Was the field school, uh, I mean, what, well now you did yours in a very different way because you had an, uh, an unusual set of opportunities and contacts, but still you were mentored by me looking over your shoulder electronically. Question, did that doing experience transform how you learned? There was once learning in the field was extraordinary, but then coming back to school, especially last semester, you saw in the moral of the sure, sure. institution class, when I came back, all of a sudden the theory meant something more because I could apply it and see it in a different way. That's why I think having the idea of giving this idea, putting this into the freshman's mind that this is what we're aiming for, this is why you're learning theory, this is why you're learning about institutions and kinship or whatever classes they choose in the major, that it does apply. But you don't really see that until you've experienced it and then come back and... Yeah. <laughs> Mind when you realize how it all comes together. Yeah. Yeah. It also enhances the quality of the education of their colleagues because, in this case, for example, many of her comments last semester in language, culture, and society were tying what we were learning to her experiences mm -hmm. in the field, and the other students were hearing that and seeing how these concepts made sense to her in terms yeah. of what she could experience out there. So, yeah. Which. Concepts into the classroom. Mm -hmm. But then, and that not, now you mentioned it towards the peers, but I also sense it towards the faculty. It makes the class a lot more lively and fun for me as a, as a teacher. Yeah. Have an experienced mentoring at BYU and the School of Ed, it, um, it, it became a process where we just paid students and multiplied the work of the faculty and was not a very positive experience for some of us. I think the difficult <coughs> situations you made so clear to the students before they came, uh, there was a winnowing out of those who didn't care. And then um, it wasn't a money issue. If these kids went because they really were having a mentoring situation where they wanted to learn. Yeah. And they, therefore, they didn't waste your time. They took a lot of your time, but it wasn't mm -hmm. wasted because they were giving so much of themselves. Yeah. And, and, and that's key. That's really key yeah. in, in, in being willing to do this for students. It, it, is not, it is something they have to do on their own individually yeah. as well as collaboratively. Now, it's worth saying in relation to all of these comments, not everybody is... Uh, succeeding in getting into, ooh, how long is, well, I guess it's still okay. Not everybody is succeeding in getting into one of these publications. Uh, if I get the next two done before July 1st, or at least submitted before July 1st, <sighs> um, there will be 50 out of 220. Now, what happened to the other 150, if my math is right? No, 170, if my math is right. And they've gone into m many different disciplines. Some of them I've kept track of, some of them I haven't. Um, some of them just really did not do field notes and never got a project going, but they probably had a reasonably helpful cultural experience. I don't know where some of them have disappeared to. Um, but it, it's not do or die. It, I mean, you don't have to publish or your life is a failure. 
um, because you carry a body of experience and knowledge into anthropology and you get another chance later. For some students, I mean, field work is a very chancy thing. It's really kind of chancy whether you bump into informants that help you versus bump into people that want to crush you. And, and so some will not succeed even though they're just as bright as all the others. And some will succeed and some get culture shock and, and, and they're at that stage of life and they'll have to do their field work another time and so on. I can just give an example of one of, one of the students when I went was Jeremy Rabe. Who was a, he was in sociology and marketing, and he did a whole marketing project on, on people selling oranges from the coast in Ishala Khan, and it was a fascinating study. I don't think he ever made it to the publishable point, but because of his field experience, he got into INSEAD business school, and now he's... What is INSEAD? INSEAD is a very um, well-known business school in France. Oh, okay. And now he is um, a big top guy at uh, an, an airline in Mexico. When I, my husband did his internship in Mexico City, I ran into Jeremy Rabe and we were like, hey, this is so funny. We were both in Guatemala five years ago doing a field study and here we are both in Mexico. My husband's doing an internship for Wharton and you're doing, uh, you're working um, for, I forget what's the name of the airline, but he was one of the head people because of his experience. That, no. And I'm sure that's how we got hired. Um, and just one more thing that I wanted to bring up about the research that I think uh, needs to be said is the towns that, that were chosen, I mean, how amazing was it that, that these two towns weren't just your average towns? I mean, the, these towns, they were hit by this hurricane, and after the hurricane, they relocated. And that is, I mean, and I, I studied the relocation, and that... And I'm I doing the, the literature review of that. It, it's hard to find anything similar that's happened anywhere in the world where a town has decided, and it wasn't the entire town that went and split the community, and you have a community staying and part of the community going. And you know, I originally wanted to go down. I was going. I had done women in development, and then I was going to go do a follow-up study on women in weaving. And then this 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 community split happened, and I said, you know. There's nothing else to study but this community split. This is what I need to focus on. Exactly. So my research was driven by what was going on in the community, and it fascinated me. It was there was so I mean there was so much I just felt like I couldn't absorb everything that was going on, and I and with Dr. Hawkins' help, I focused it and, and was able to make I think a very good paper. But it, it I, I think it, to me it was just an interesting lesson in how your research can sometimes be dictated by things you know beyond your control. No, and, and that's a classic example. You study the theory, you set up your proposal, but you have to be flexible. You're studying their culture, what they're interested in, and when you get there, it may be totally different than what you were hoping for. The same thing happens in archaeology. Oh, well, yeah. <laughs> you found something you didn't expect to find. And you follow the lead on that. Yeah, absolutely. John. In fact, Cynthia's comment would be great if students knew about this earlier, but can you give them a taste of this, doing little projects locally in lower courses? I have wondered about that, and I think the, if, 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 if I were to start a career again and had another 40 years to go at it. <laughs> um, Your dad's 96, so you know, <laughs> <laughs> the, 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 the pores and dart eyes are coming out here, John. <laughs> In case you guys don't know, I am signed for retirement on July 1st. And, and, um, <clears throat> Come back with some other person. <laughs> <laughs> with a new wife. <laughs> In Mormonism, all things are possible. <laughs> Well, would it be great to have your retrospective how you would have done it differently if you knew what you knew? If I knew what I knew, if I, well, in the religion class that we just did, I had you guys go out in uh, different religious groups. I think this could be done, and, 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 the, and I used to give the, you know, do me a 30-page paper on, uh, Two pages on the relationship between your weekend with this church and what Durkheim had to say in um, elementary forms of religious life. Four weeks later, two pages on how it relates to what Marx had to say about religion. 
three weeks later, two pages on, on uh, you know, uh, Weber, and two so, more. So you managed to get their personal experience hooked up to what's going on in class. Yes, exactly. I think it could be done at a 101. If I were doing it in 101 now, I would uh, find out who has which languages, and I would assign the topic of religion, because that's something that all are interested in and all have, they've, they've got a dog in the fight on it. Um, and I would, um, and I would pair the students so that in a, to a Spanish Pentecostal congregation, if there's a Spanish speaking student plus an English speaking student, send two students and they can, because the kids speak English, and so on, so there's plenty to be done in English and plenty to be done in Spanish. But in a 101 class, uh, even in the 900 section, person section, you got people that speak Chinese, Thai, blah, blah, blah. We should be able to do some really interesting things on comparative religion, comparative ethnicity, ethnic adaptation, uh, refugees here in Utah Valley, and so on, and have them be just many things. And then by the time that they are juniors, when they go to India or Africa or um, Thailand with Jake or whatever on the ethnographic or the archaeology field school, uh, they've really got a grasp of some of the issues and how to do it. It, it could be phenomenal what we could produce. Yeah, I've, I've, done, I've done it with one on one. Sorry, my voice is a little gone. Oh yeah, our time is up. What Cindy suggested, I didn't do in 101, which was to actually have a, a, a day that's sort of dedicated. It could be a day when you talk about ethnography generally, and that we dedicate to you know, some cultural uh, uh, that we dedicate to talking about at least 20 minutes of doing what you've done here, of saying why we do the field school, the fact that we do the field school, and then why we do the field school, what some of the benefits are. I think if students in a 101 class are, I think that could be. I'd be a great way to get some PR, maybe even post students. We have to be out of here at 4.30, which is two minutes from now. I thank you all for coming and uh, listening and <laughs> chatting with me.